I've had my issues and problems with things that WWE have done over the years. That's absolutely true. I've got a laundry list of videos on this channel stretching over a decade that calls them out. One of my biggest gripes and biggest problems with them is their propensity, their history, for undercutting their own talent. I never have understood it. I don't understand it today, and I never will understand it, nor do I want to. Because sometimes things are so stupid, they don't merit a benefit of the doubt, they don't merit additional considerations, they don't merit full context, they're just damn stupid. And throughout my life of being a WWE fan, I've seen it time after time after time, and it certainly hasn't gotten any better in the last 10 to 15 years. In fact, I could argue it's only gotten worse. If you don't, don't fit into the plans of the WWE machine, no matter whether or not what you're doing is working or working really well, they're going to undercut you. Good example of this. And I know it's one week, so it's, you got to be careful not to overreact too much, but it is illustrative of a point. Going into Money in the Bank, you had a lot of fans thinking that L.A. Knight was the most worthy guy. He's the one that's the most over. He should be the one that wins the Money in the Bank briefcase. To me, it was, it was either Logan Paul or it's L.A. Knight. And you could clearly tell that Damian Priest kind of felt like a compromise candidate, a compromise selection. But that, that's whatever. Like, L.A. Knight not winning Money in the Bank is not the be-all, end-all to his career. However, when you follow up on Friday night at SmackDown and know that this guy, whether you've tried to present him that way or not, whether you've wanted it this way or not, there is no question he's one of the most over-talents that you have on your roster. And you go an entire two hours without putting him on SmackDown once. Instead, you do some dumb dick frickin' digital exclusive segment with him. So that way, people have got to go online to see it instead of, you know, maybe wanting to see the two and a half million people or so that watch SmackDown see one of your hottest acts in the company. Like, who the fuck would want to do that, right? And you can make all types of excuses, well... The Bloodline segment ran long. No, you know what? It's called WWE doing dumb dick petty shit because any person with a logical brain would say, hey, we're going to build the show around the Bloodline. We're going to build the show around somebody like an LA Knight. This is not fucking hard to figure out. You got to cut out other segments and other shit. You do that. But you don't cut their time. If anything, you find ways to give them more. But this is a pattern and a trend for WWE. And we'll see how it plays out with LA Knight. But they have a long storied history of undercutting their own talent. And especially those guys that kind of organically get over outside of the desires of the WWE machine. The first example that jumps to most everybody's mind is Zack Ryder. He wasn't getting used on TV at all. How dare he go and do that Long Island Ice Z YouTube show and kind of teach the WWE how the fuck to use social media. How dare he build that large online following that helped him get massively over to the point where he was a top merch seller and he wasn't even being featured on freaking TV. Now eventually the WWE said, yeah, I guess we kind of don't have a choice here. We got to put him on TV. But the first chance they got, the first chance they got, they put him on camera after a couple of months they decided, hey, we're going to have John Cena mess with his girl in kayfabe. We're going to have Kane punk him out. And we're going to bury his fucking ass to a point where he's never going to recover. That'll teach him. Instead of giving the customers, your fan base, something that they actually were interested in, the WWE actively worked to sabotage Sack Ryder for reasons that are still unbeknownst to me other than putty, petty jealousy. Talk about 2011, same year, 2011, CM Punk. I don't think WWE really anticipated 
how interesting CM Punk was going to become for a lot of their fans going into the summer of 2011. So instead of really rolling with that and riding that momentum from Money in the Bank and really adjusting and saying, hey, you know what? We got to pivot here a little bit. They did what the dumb dick WWE always does. They panicked because we got a pay-per-view to sell. They brought back CM Punk after eight days, whoop the fucking do And then they ultimately have him get pinned by Del Rio, if you remember, with the Money in the Bank cash-in at SummerSlam, so he doesn't even lead the fucking champion. And then he goes on to lose the next several pay-per-views and doesn't win again until fucking Survivor Series. And then they went out of their way to make sure they made him a mid-card world champion to the point where he's playing second fiddle to Johnny Ace and John Cena. But because CM Punk didn't fit the image of what WWE wanted, they were always going to fuck with him in some way, shape, or form. Damian Sandow got himself over as a heel. What did WWE do? Well, he didn't really do it our way. We got to go with it to a certain degree. But first chance we got, we're going to fucking stick the screws to him. They have him win money in the bank, bury him after he wins money in the bank, and then he fails to cash in successfully. So then eventually, he switches over to becoming a baby face. And you remember the whole Mizdow stuff. And he was getting over again. Like, this is a guy, he got over as a heel. He got over as a baby face. So the WWE's response is said, hey, saying, hey, this is a pretty talented guy. He can make a lot of things work. They stopped putting him on fucking TV. They weren't behind him like that. So they gave his career the ultimate death sentence. They stopped putting him on TV. Even though he had proven on both sides of the character spectrum, heel and face, that he could get fucking over. Why? Because WWE didn't want it that way. Cesaro. Didn't matter how much the crowd enjoyed him. Didn't matter how much the crowd got behind him. Didn't matter that his style stood out and was kind of different. It was believable. It was physical. Something the roster was lacking at the time. Vince didn't see it. He's on record saying he didn't see it. And it didn't fucking matter. He was never going to go there. Even if the customers are telling you they want you to go there. Like, that's the level of petty we're talking about with Vince McMahon. That's the level of stubborn stupidity we are speaking of with WWE. Look at Rusev. Remember how Rusev Day just organically got over and became a bit of a monster in a good way? The crowd was hot for that shit. Like, that shit was working. Even though they were trying to stick the screws to Rusev and they were trying to fuck with him, it was working. So what happens ultimately, the WWE refuses to go all the way with it. They actively work to undercut him. And now he's gone from being wasted by WWE to getting wasted in AEW. And not wasted in the tipsy-tipsy way. Baron Corbin. At a time a couple of years ago, we had millions of people negatively financially impacted by COVID and unemployment and layoffs. Here comes the broke Baron Corbin, bum-ass Baron Corbin character. Was arguably among the very top of most interesting acts in WWE at the time. Certainly the most relatable. I can even go back through my tweet history and say at that time, I was getting more interaction with tweets involving Baron Corbin than I was with the tribal chief Roman Reigns. But the first chance WWE got... They said, oh, this might actually work. We can't fucking do that. We got to undercut it. We got to wrap it up for no real fucking reason. And now where's Baron Corbin doing dick? Like, what is it about WWE that they just can't admit sometimes that, hey, the fans want us to go in this direction. Yeah, the fans are fickle. And sometimes you're like, oh, we know better what, what the fans want. And we're going to pound it under, in their, down their throats until they like it. WWE certainly has a history of that. But it's this whole notion, this whole concept of so actively wanting to go against the grain for the sake of going against the grain that will never make any damn sense to me. Like Zack Ryder still to this day stands out as the most notable example of that. You've seen people over the years talk about this. Jericho talked about it before, saying, for some reason, if WWE doesn't believe in you, no matter what, they're going to find a way to put the screws to you. You remember five years ago, Cody Rhodes and I had the big tiff on Twitter, 
And one of the things I called out was him being full of shit when he said that WWE doesn't actively hold people back when he himself before multiple times had said they had done it to him and others. And we all know this is fucking true. Like, why would you actively hold people back? And I'm really disappointed. I don't expect much from wrestling journalists, grant you. But I'm really disappointed when anybody's ever interviewed Vince McMahon or anybody in WWE and you hear him talk about breaking through glass ceilings and grabbing the brass ring or the gold ring or whatever the fuck type of ring it is. And in no point in time does anybody ever really ask them, well, they can only do that if you allow them to do it no matter how fucking good they are. Right? Right? Exactly. So don't hold that out there as some like gettable, gottable target for everyone because it's clearly fucking not. And it's stupid. Why be so stubborn for the hell of it? The WWE has ruined a number of viable, interesting characters over the years because Vince McMahon doesn't see it in him. And if he don't see it in them, that's all that matters. Who the fuck runs their company like that? We'll see what happens with L.A. Knight. And hopefully at some point he can get to a place where he can be truly undeniable, where even the knuckleheads at Titan Tower can't deny him. But when I look and see that one of your hottest, most interesting acts isn't even booked on the SmackDown after Money in the Bank. But you go and you see his digital exclusive segment is by far the most watched segment from the show. I say, you know what? This guy is over. And you know what? WWE clearly doesn't give a shit. Because they don't give a shit. They're going to do it their way, no matter what. And it sucks. It always has been like that.